So let's go. Um, hello, my name is Dmitry Vyukov, and I'm going to talk about um, how to design subsystems for fuzzability. And um, so we work on kernel fuzzing, um, kernel, kernel fuzzer syscaller. Uh, and this talk is reflections on why uh, some subsystems were easier to fuzz and we get better coverage, while some other subsystems were harder to fuzz. Um, I will answer questions at the end, and we also have a syscaller matrix chat room that will be active uh, for the next three days. Uh, you can ask uh, questions also there and about my talk and about Alexander's talk as well. And I will mostly skip the intro slides because Alexander already did intro in the previous talk. So uh, Sysbot has a dashboard at syscolorapspot.com. There you can see a list of the open bugs we have. And for each bug, you can see uh, lots of information about this bug. And also one of the things we have is coverage reports, which you can also find on the dashboard. And if you click on it, you will see um, an HTML where on the left side, you will see kernel directory structure and files with percent of coverage. And if you click on the file, you will see actual coverage for this file. And this is usually um, very useful to figure out where the fuzzer has stuck and why it's not making progress. So we have some subsystems that are better covered and some subsystems that are worse covered. And this talk is basically about how to make your code well covered. Uh, so there is significant overlap between fuzzability and general testability. And I would define testability for, for the kernel roughly as uh, you can write a user space test for, for it. Uh, this test can run in a virtual machine. Uh, this test is isolated and reproducible. Uh, it's fully automated and you can test all features in a single kernel build. Uh, but fuzzability adds some additional aspects on top. First of all, the code needs to be hardened against crazy inputs. Uh, this is generally is true for non-root subsystems, but it's not always true for root-only subsystems. Uh, also, it needs to be isolated and reproducible in presence of random inputs, and in particular, don't require some special tricky setup and teardown sequence because the fuzzer may just not do this sequence. And it should be reasonably easy to generate inputs automatically because uh, they are generated by, by a program which is not as smart as humans. Okay, now uh, I will move to some concrete aspects. And the first one is um, elephant in the room, which is requiring hardware for to test a subsystem. So usually we have some hardware and then a driver that talks to this hardware. And then we maybe have some common code for the subsystem and uh, a test that talks to this common part. Uh, so the claim is if your subsystem requires particular hardware, then it will not be tested and it will have bugs. Even it, if it was um, correct initially, people will do refactoring, they will try to fix some minor bugs and introduce major bugs and so on. Um, so in solution to this is what's called stubs or um, emulators. And the most famous example is probably a network tune device. Uh, so it pretends to be a network card and allows to test the common part of the networking stack. And also the test can uh, inject network packets from user space. So for this reason, it's important for the test to be able to talk uh, to the stub. Uh, there are other examples as well. Uh, and in this, uh, in this case, we don't test the actual driver code. Um, which is suboptimal, but say if you look at the common part of the networking stack or media or USB, the common part is very substantial. So it's totally worth testing on its own. Uh, so another thing you can do is you can create an emulator for actual hardware, and this way you can activate the driver code as well. So this is better because we get more coverage uh, but the thing is that uh, I think there's currently no good way to actually write such tests. So there is KUnit platform mock that is supposed to do this, but I think it's still not quite there and there are not 
um, not lots of good examples that you can look at to, to write your own stuff. Uh, and for completeness, you can also create a stop in Coermo, uh, but this is unfortunately not working well for us. Uh, one reason is that in this case, test cannot talk to the stop because it's actually outside of the, of the kernel of the machine. Uh, also, lots of testing today runs in the cloud and you, like, you cannot supply your Coermo uh, for the cloud. You can, of course, run Coermo um, in a vir cloud virtual machine as nested, but uh, it usually turns out to be very slow and barely usable. Uh, there are also issues with isolation and reproducibility because Coermo usually creates one or few uh, global devices that became shared um, and they're always in a dirty state. Uh, also, for completeness, you can actually run syscaller on your um, actual hardware and fuzz your driver this way. It's just we are not uh, doing this um, on sysbot, but you can do this locally. Okay, even if there is a stub, uh, like some of them are still not uh, very well suited for us. Uh, for example, a stub may allow creation of only one or small fixed number of devices, and then those became shared and in dirty state again. Uh, some stubs allow to create new transient devices, uh, but then uh, they become sticky and require some special cleanup to destroy them, and the fuzz are just not doing this cleanup. Uh, so they again become um, shared and global and uh, dirty. Some only work in init namespace, um, and some require very complex configuration, which Fuzzer has hard time doing. Uh, so what would be the ideal situation? Ideally, I would like to see something like uh, you have an ioctal on, say, your debugfs file, which creates a new, completely new, fresh stub. Maybe it accepts some initial configuration for the stub. And it gives you two file descriptors, one for the, for the stop part and then the second one for the actual device uh, part that user space can use to communicate with this device. And since those are file descriptors, they will be destroyed when uh, the test process terminates and they will be automatically cleaned up as well. So that, that's how an ideal stop would look like. Uh, now we're done with uh, hardware and move to some general um, recommendations for, for just normal kernel code. So again, it's always good to have fresh transient instances uh, for whatever your subsystem provides. And memfd create is a good example of a good um, API versus, uh, let's say, shared memory IDs or IPC IDs, which are global shared and uh, who's frequently in a dirty state. Um, also, uh, don't do unreasonable restrictive assumptions, like say only initnet or only one instance of your resource. Um, also provide killability, which is like ability to kill the process with kill minus nine, uh, which is generally true, but we found at least one case, which is fuse, which creates processes that you cannot kill minus nine, which is very nasty for fuzzing. Um, also, sometimes we see some global settings, for example, CCTLs that allow you to switch between, say, configuration A and B, for example, doing BPFG or not doing BPFG. Um, and this is not very handy. It would be like better if um, user space could ask for JIT or not JIT with every program, say, uh, load this program and JIT it or not JIT it. Uh, there still could be a global setting that would restrict possible option, but it's still like would be better if the test could ask uh, could ask for a particular configuration. Uh, as, an, as I mentioned, uh, code should be hardened against crazy inputs, even if it's root only code. First of all, it will allow to test uh, the non crazy part, which you do want to do, and second, uh, just think about say bugs in user space program run by root. Maybe it's been just developed. For example, you developed an admin tool, and like as you developed it, it just crashes the kernel because you have some uh, stupid bug. Uh, in some cases, we have to disable some subsystems in testing because they just crash all the time, and developers say that it's not an issue. 
Mm, worn on. So do use worn on to uh, for various inver invariants and assumptions in your code. Uh, that's what will allow further to catch logical bugs in your code besides just uh, crashes. And we actually found lots and lots of them, so they are very useful. Uh, also, they're very good for documentation and documentation that you actually can trust uh, and that is up to date as compared to, say, comments. Uh, if you have some expensive checks that you don't want to enable in production build, you can add a uh, separate debug config that will enable those checks. And please, please, please don't use worn on for um, any kind of bad user inputs or bad hardware behavior. Uh, use it for, um, so worn on should mean a kernel bug. Uh, only that will enable automated kernel testing and fuzzing. And now we move to the last part, which is um, a design of your API. Uh, so syscall are based on uh, descriptions of your API in a special DSL language called syslang. And this language contains descriptions of system calls with their argument types, uh, also descriptions of enumerations and structures. So you can roughly think of this as uh, see header file declarations of function, enums, and structures. And this is what allows the scholar to generate some more or less reasonable uh, test cases. Uh, but this also, the consequence is that you cannot, uh, yes, and the, the, the distinction with um, header files is that uh, it has more semantic information and it's completely machine usable. So there are no uh, implicit parts and comments and so on. But the consequence is that uh, it cannot describe just any crazy interface. It can only describe the things it can describe. Uh, so the general recommendation is stick to standard patterns uh, because it, um, the language can describe all of the standard common things. And I will uh, show you some examples of non-standard things that we discovered. Um, as you know, uh, in most cases, collections are passed to kernel as arrays. So you have pointer to element and number of elements in the array, right? But we found one case, I think, where uh, a linked list is used to pass the collection to the kernel with the actual next pointer in the structure. And this created some issues for, for the fuzzer because like it initially it went into infinite recursion and there were some other issues. Uh, but also it created issues for the kernel because this actually structure needs to be converted uh, for compat uh, handling. And as you can imagine, converting a linked list is very non-trivial. So it, it required some significant amount on complex code to do this. And as you can guess, it also led uh, to some very bad security issues because the user space can actually modify uh, that memory as you try to convert it forth and back. Um, and that is that becomes uh, very tricky to handle because you cannot say first count number of elements and then convert it because the user space can actually change uh, things underneath. Uh, so the next example is use of user space pointers as IDs. And we found, I think, two cases so far. Um, and one is in the old asynchronous IO subsystem. So you can issue an IO request. And if later you want to cancel it, you need to pass exactly the same user space pointer to this function, to IO cancel function. And this pointer will be used to identify uh, the request you want to cancel. And for this, we still don't have proper support. So the fuzzer just usually doesn't pass the same pointer because it's not used anywhere else. And again, as a recurrent pattern, uh, this also created an issue for the kernel itself uh, because it cannot blindly trust the pointer passed. It needs to verify that it's correct. And to do this, it uh, works um, a link list and a global mutex, which is just disaster for performance. Uh, there is an actual comment saying this sucks. Uh, so if this code would use a standard pattern, say FD or IDR, then there also would be um, standard function to handle this efficiently. Yeah, consistency. So there is a thing um, called network device ID. 
uh, device index. Uh, and everywhere it's encoded as in 32, but there's one place in the kernel that uses uh, UN16 to pass this, pass this uh, index. And this is very nasty for the fuzzer uh, because it, it knows about things like say file descriptor or um, device index, but this notion is tied to, to the underlying type, which is, for example, it knows that file descriptor is always in 32. Uh, so we actually cannot describe this, you know, the same thing, but in a different type. We can say it's a um, device index, but then it will be 32 bits and um, layout of the structure will be masked. Or we can say it's just a random integer. Yeah, this is one of the cases where we, that kind of makes you want to find the developer and ask why. Uh, net filter. So um, long story short, uh, for net filter, you need to pass some um, large blob of information from user space in a super complex format, which includes some parallel arrays, some cross references, some derived info, um, array uh, size of arrays with variable size elements, which is almost always like a pointless thing to pass, and some other things. So this format was just a nightmare to kind of for the fuzzer to generate to generate like correct instance that will pass some initial validation. And as you can guess, it also uh, lead to dozens and dozens of bugs in the kernel in this um, conversion and checking code. And I think there's still coming. Um, next thing is human or oriented chatty protocols. Um, so when you want to create a new pseudo terminal, you want to obtain uh, two file descriptors to both ends of the terminal. And to do this, you open a file, it gives you a handle to one end. Uh, then you need to call an ioctal, uh, which gives you an integer. And then you need to convert this integer to a string to form a file system path. And then you open this path and this gives you handle to the second file descriptor. And this sequence is like harder than necessary. Um, and it's harder for the fuzzer to kind of create, and especially this conversion of integer to string, because it doesn't appear basically anywhere else. So we don't have good support for this. Uh, so again, how, how an ideal interface would look like, it, it may be, say, pipe-like interface where we have inter, um, single ioctal that gives you uh, file descriptors to both ends of the terminal at the same time. Um, so the summary for your API, basically stick to existing patterns and be consistent with existing code. Don't use convoluted formats with derived info. Be nice to machines. Um, at some point, we hopefully will do um, automatic extractions of those interfaces and some inference, but this will require interfaces to be consistent even more. And it's always a good idea if you develop a new subsystem to also write uh, syscolor descriptions at the same time. Uh, so this way you get some early fuzzing coverage, but also um, it will make you uh, use better UAPI patterns be just because you won't be able to express something that is not standard. Uh, okay, and the recap for the whole talk, um, basically allow testing and virtual machines provide fresh transient instances, um, use warn on and stick to standard UABI patterns. And with this, I'm ready to answer questions if we have any time. And as I mentioned, we have Syscolor uh, chat room. So if you have any remaining questions, uh, feel free to ask them there. Thank you. Rooms mic was muted, and so you may not be hearing it. I think technically it's to mute the mic in the room, the on site room. You can ask me questions. You don't need to mute, uh, mute yourself, Dimitri. <laughs> there was an echo happening over there.
Any questions? If people have any questions, if they could type them in the chat while we get the sound sorted. The room is on. The room is on mute and need to be unmuted. So for the AV text in the room, if they could please unmute the mic, that would be helpful. Got the room muted. People have questions, could they type them in the chat in the interim so we can relay them on to the speaker? Sorry, Dimitri. Multiple things going wrong simultaneously here. <laughs> okay, that's so fine. To get out. Mm -hmm. yeah, hi. Ah, hi. Can you hear me? I'm in well. Yep, we can. Yes. Go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. How to um, first thanks Dimitri's contribution and uh, um, we are trying to build our um, father against our drivers and uh, um, one challenge one challenge of us is that in the uh, IAPTO Cisco's and we need a better way to um generate the patterns automatically and uh, the you know uh, currently we just scan our code and uh, and uh, to capture that that um, the comment argument that we pass to our to our i uh, 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 calls and uh, that argument will um, fall into some switch um, case. But, um, I just want to know if there are any better ways to um, generate yeah. that, that um, uh, numbers. I almost get most of the questions, but not some of the details because audio quality is not good. Uh, so, what exactly is the issue with the IOCTAL argument? It's, I just want to know if there is a better way to to um, generate uh, test patterns. Better way than what? I don't know. Maybe that's a better discussion for a chat, um, that metrics chat or mailing list, because oh, I feel okay. it will need some like details. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Feel free to um, use the metrics chat or the mailing list. Yeah. Well, Sorry. Okay. Yeah. The, the the room is live again, so that's why the sound is coming in and echoing. Yeah, I, I think we have the 20 minute break now. Um, so thank you, Dimitri. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.